Hello, everyone. I hope you're all healthy and well. Welcome to the next talk in our Golden Webinars in Astrophysics series. Our speaker today is Martin Rees, who is a fellow of Trinity College and Emeritus Professor of Cosmology and Astrophysics and Astronomer Royale at the University of Cambridge. My name is Thomas Puzia, and together with Elisabeth Arthur de la Villamoire, we have organized today's webinar for you. As in our previous webinars, simultaneous language interpretation is provided by Mr. Patricio Gonzalez, who will be simultaneously translating for us into Spanish. En sus dispositivos pueden escuchar la interpretación al español de la conferencia a pinchar el botón de interpretación que se encuentra abajo en la parte inferior derecha de la ventana de la aplicación Zoom y seleccionar obviamente el español. We would like to acknowledge the generous support of the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA, for the Spanish acronym for making the series possible. Thank you so much for all your feedback and comments. If you are watching a recording of this talk on YouTube, please leave your comments below. If you would like to support the Golden uh, Webinar series or give us feedback, please send us an email. If you have any questions during the talk, please type them in the Q&A window you can also upvote questions and comments on them. We will select the best questions for the discussion after the talk. Before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce our other panel members that are with us today. We have, of course, uh, Martin Rees, our speaker, uh, Patricio Gonzalez as the interpreter, Thomas Putze and myself as co-hosts uh, from the faculty at the Institutes of Institute of Astrophysics at PUC, we have a Franz Bauer, Alejandro Cocleati, and Enan Quintana, uh, which is a faculty emeritus at the Institute of Astrophysics. From the Institute of Astrophysics at PUC, we have at our postdocs, uh, Paula Ronco and Demetra de Checo. We also have the great pleasure to welcome our guest panelists today, Evelyn Johnston, our first generation co-host of the web Golden Webinar series, who is now professor of astronomy at the University Diego Portales in Santiago. Adam Rees, Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at Johns Hopkins University and the Space Telescope Science Institute and 2011 Nobel Laureate in Physics. James Peebles, Albert Einstein, Professor of Science at Princeton University and 2011, 2011 Nobel Laureate in Physics. Joel Primack, Distinguished Professor of Physics Emeritus at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Barry Mador, Astronomer at the Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena. And Eric Linder, Cosmologist at the University of California at Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And last but not least, we have our excellent Q&A manager, Ricardo Acevedo. So it is our great pleasure to introduce Sir Martin Rees as our golden webinar speaker today. Martin has obtained his PhD degree at the University of Cambridge in 1967, and he held postdoctoral positions in the UK and in the US before becoming a professor at Sussex University in 1972. In 1973, he became a fellow of King's College and Bloomian Professor of Astronomy and Experimental Philosophy at Cambridge and served for 10 years as director of Cambridge Institute of Astronomy. In 1992 to 2003, Martin was a Royal Society professor and then from 2004 to 2012, Master of Trinity College. Since 2001, he has been an Emeritus Professor at the University of Cambridge and a Fellow of Trinity College since 2012. In 2005, Martin was appointed to the House of Lords and was President of the Royal Society from 2005 to 2010. He has been awarded numerous prizes and honors, such as the Gold Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society, the Gruber Prize in Cosmology, the Balsam International Prize, and most recently the Fritz Zwicky Award for his fundamental and outstanding contributions related to astrophysics and cosmology. He holds the honorary title of Astronomer Royale and also visiting professor in the Perry College London and Leicester University. Martin has published more than 500 research papers as well as 11 books and numerous magazine and newspaper articles on scientific and general subjects. He has made contributions to the origin of cosmic microwave background radiation 
as well as to galaxy clustering and formation. Since the 90s, Martin has worked on gamma ray bursts and on how the cosmic dark ages ended when the first stars formed. He has written and spoken extensively about the problems and challenges of the 21st century and the interface between science, ethics, and politics. So now, so we now hand over to Martin, who will tell us about progress and frustration in cosmology. So please, Martin, uh, you can start. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me to give a webinar in this series. It's a great pleasure and privilege. And my first slide uh, shows Trinity College, Cambridge, which is where I work. And the next slide, this is the best student we ever had in Trinity, uh, Isaac Newton. And uh, uh, legend has it that he had his biggest idea in the plague year when the college was shut down and he went back to his home and sat under the apple tree. Well, of course, the college is shut down uh, now, the first time since 1665. Uh, let's hope that some of our present students have equal inspiration though I'm not holding my breath. He must have thought about space travel. This is a picture from his, his book. It shows a cannonball being fired from a mountaintop, and if it's fired at the right speed, it goes into a circular orbit. This is still the neatest way to explain orbital flight. But it has to go at 25,000 kilometers per hour to go into this orbit, and that can't be done with the canon of his time and was first done famously, of course, in 1957 when Sputnik 1 went into orbit. And that started the space age. And only 12 years later than that, we had this iconic image, Earthrise, taken by Ed Anders in Apollo 7. And then we had the moon landings. This picture was signed for me a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts, and I cherish it. But you've got to be middle-aged to remember when people walked on the moon. Uh, this is uh, uh, Apollo 17, 1972, and no one's been back since then. And indeed, manned space flight has languished. No one's been further than low Earth orbit. But space technology has, of course, uh, burgeoned. We spend on it every day for sat-nav communication and environmental monitoring, and of course, for putting telescopes up in space to observe in wave bands we can't see from the ground. But probes, of course, have physically explored the solar system. And I thought I'd start off before getting to the large scale universe uh, by uh, going out on a little tour from the Earth, getting close ups of all the planets of our solar system. If you get launched into space and you look back from, say, 10 million miles, you would see the Earth and the Moon, the Sun coming from the right, like this. And then the first thing you would encounter is the red planet, Mars. And many objects have landed on this. This is the Curiosity probe. And there are three more probes which are going to get to Mars within the next month. Curiosity probe is trundling across this huge crater over a few years. And then further out, we have Jupiter. And this is the Juno spacecraft, which uh, showed that the weather at the North Pole of Jupiter is rather turbulent. This is a picture of the clouds and vortices near the surface of Jupiter. And of course, Jupiter has the uh, uh, Galilean uh, satellites, the moons, which have been observed in close up. And they're, they're very dif different from each other, and they're quite familiar to us. Going still further out, Cassini uh, spent 13 years monitoring Saturn and its moons and sent back huge numbers of pictures. Let me just show you a couple of them. Uh, this is a picture of an eclipse of, of, of the sun by Saturn. Cassini is lined up so that uh, um, Saturn is along the line of sight. And so you, you don't see uh, the sun, but you see the rings lit up. And well, those too small to be seen here, that's where the Earth would be. And Saturn's moons are fascinating. This is uh, a close up of uh, Titan's moon. Looks rather nice with these lakes, uh, but uh, it, they're lakes of methane, minus 160 degrees centigrade temperature. 
And this is Enceladus, which uh, is a moon with ice on the surface. Uh, there's evidence for an ocean underneath, and people wonder, could the things be swimming in that ocean? And going still further out, uh, NASA's New Horizon sent back pictures of Pluto uh, about 12,000 times further away than the moon. The instruments that brought back these pictures took about 10 years on their journey, so they're all really 1990s technology. Think how much better we could do today. I'm sure the entire solar system would be permeated by flotillas of robotic craft and fabricators. And as miniaturization and AI advance, there'll be less need to send people. Nonetheless, although this is not the subject of this talk, I do hope that human explorers will follow the robots, though it'll be as adventurers rather than for practical goals. And I think they should be funded by sponsors or uh, not by taxpayers. And of course, uh, we all know about the efforts of SpaceX and Blue Origin. And uh, later this century, courageous thrill seekers may well establish a base on Mars. And Elon Musk himself has said that he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. And I think he's 49 years old now, so he may make it. And good luck to him. Because the fact that humans are ill-adapted to Mars and space means they'll have an incentive to modify themselves using all the super powerful genetic and cyborg technology that we'll have by 2100. And maybe they'll evolve into new species. That'll be the future. And they can explore far beyond our solar system. But that raises the question, of course, is there life, even intelligent life, beyond the Earth already? And we know that there's not going to be any advanced life elsewhere in our solar system. But if we look to the realm of the stars, then things are very different. And perhaps the hottest topic in astronomy now is the realization that many other stars, perhaps even most of them, are orbited by retinues of planets, just like the sun is. These planets aren't detected directly, but they're inferred by precise measurements of their parent stars. Oh, this picture shows uh, my colleague Didier Kello, who just won the Nobel Prize for detecting the first one, and he's naturally feeling rather cheerful that day. But the technique used not by him, but by others, uh, is to uh, look for the transits, which will cause a slight dimming of the star that's being transited. And so by looking how deep the transit is, you can infer how big the planet is. And by the interval between transits, that tells you the uh, uh, year of the planet. And the Kepler uh, spacecraft famously observed a patch of sky about seven degrees across and looked at the brightness of 100,000 stars, measuring it precisely every hour or so, and it found literally thousands of these citations. And uh, uh, this montage on the bottom left, there's this sort of rather silly uh, sort of uh, Ouroboros, which actually shows uh, a lot of the planets detected by uh, Kepler. Um, the size indicates the size of the planets and the period. But this just indicates a huge amount of data and there's a huge variety among these planets. But the important point is that so far, we have inferred planets indirectly by their effect on their parent star, by the way the star dims in a transit, and in some cases also by the way the star's motion wobbles uh, due to the gravity of a planet orbiting it. But we'd really like to find evidence for planets uh, which are like the Earth and to actually see them, to detect them. And that's hard. To realize how hard, uh, let's suppose that alien astronomers with a powerful telescope were looking at the Earth from, say, 30 light years away. Then the sun would look at an ordinary star, and our planet would see him in Carl Sagan's phrase, a pale blue dot, very close in the sky to its star, our sun that outshines it by many billions, a far fly next to a searchlight. 
but the shade of blue will be slightly different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Eurasia was facing them. So the alien astronomers could infer that there were continents and oceans, the length of our day, something of our seasons, and the climate. And by analyzing the faint light, they could infer from an edge due to chlorophyll and other features that it had a biosphere. And the exciting thing is that we know that there are literally millions of planets like the Earth in our galaxy. But even the nearest are too faint to be detected now. But this will change with the next generation of telescopes. And let me put a plug in for um, this telescope. This is the uh, uh, telescope which uh, is built by the European Space uh, Southern Observatory. They're not very imaginative in their naming. It's called the Extremely Large Telescope. Um, and uh, of course, it will allow Europeans and Chileans uh, to observe with a uh, telescope with a mirror 39 meters across, a mosaic of 800 pieces of glass. And with a high resolution spe spectrograph, this may be able to separate out the light from the planet and the light from the star sufficiently to be able to get a crude spectrum of the planet of a nearby star and infer, for instance, uh, if it's got a biosphere. So this is going to be an exciting subject in the next uh, um, few years. Well, we know that there are millions, even billions perhaps, of planets orbiting stars in our galaxy, which are inhabited, sorry, which are habitable, but habitable doesn't mean inhabited. It could still be that life's very rare. We don't know enough about how life began here on Earth to lay confident odds. We don't know what triggered the transition from complex molecules into entities that can uh, metabolize and reproduce. It might have been a rare, rare fluke, or this crucial transition might have been almost inevitable given the right environment. And just as a point that will come up later in this talk, let me emphasize that complexity is greater in the biological world than in any of the physical world. We physicists with stars and galaxies are doing simple things. This is a flea, and I show this because this is uh, uh, drawn by uh, uh, Robert Hooke, who was Newton's least favorite colleague, who had an early microscope and was a wonderful draftsman. I show this simply to indicate that a flea has layer upon layer of complex structure and is far more complicated than an atom or a star. Um, but we don't know uh, whether there is any kind of life of any kind elsewhere in the universe. It could be teeming with life, we don't know. But that is the big question. It's the question one's always asked when people know you're an astronomer. But I won't say any more about, um, the, about life and planets. Uh, let's go back now to the physical world and to the stars, far simpler than biology. Stars are powered, of course, by nuclear fusion, and we understand their life cycles and how it depends on their mass. New stars are forming in places like the Eagle Nebula, shown here, and we see stars dying. This is what the sun will look like in about six billion years when it runs out of fuel and the core becomes a white dwarf. And here's the remnant of a massive star. This is uh, the famous Crab Nebula, uh, which is the uh, aftermath of a supernova witnessed and recorded by Chinese astronomers, by the Chinese astronomer royal, as it were, who told the emperor that a guest star had appeared and was brighter than the moon. And that's recorded here. And although such events may seem far away and long ago, we wouldn't be here were it not for events like this. And the reason for that is that before a massive star explodes, it's developed a sort of onion skin structure where to get nuclear fuel, the hotter inner layers have been burnt further up the periodic table. You get carbon and oxygen, then neon, magnesium, etc. And when the star explodes, 
all these are spewed out into interstellar space and they then condense into new stars. And indeed one can show uh, that the proportions in which the elements will be made in stars is more or less the proportions in which they're observed uh, in, in our galaxy. So we are, in a sense, the ashes of long de dead stars, or if you're less romantic, we're the nuclear waste from the fuel that made stars shine. Each of us has inside us um, atoms that came from many hundreds of stars that lived and died all over the Milky Way and died five billion years ago or more. The people who developed this idea back in the 1950s were a very strong group of Margaret and Jeffrey Burbage, Willie Fowler and Fred Hoyle. This picture was taken in 1971 for Willie Fowler's seven, uh, 60th birthday, which he had in Cambridge and he was a, a model train buff. Margaret Burbage lived to be 100. Here she is opening a birthday card for her 100th birthday. And she died just a few months ago, um, having outlived all the others and had a wonderful life. So what's B squared FH, as the paper is always called, uh, uh, showed, and it's been borne out by all the later work over the subsequent 60 years, uh, is that our galaxy is um, uh, like an ecological system where pristine material, mainly hydrogen, form stars, and then when they die, they put it back into interstellar space, new stars form, and those stars uh, then contain heavy elements and they can form planets, and some of those planets may harbor life. So this complicated process, which I won't go into, uh, is going on in our galaxy. If we were to be able to get three million light years away and look back at our galaxy, we see something like this. This of course is Andromeda, the nearest big galaxy to us. It's a um, spinning disk viewed obliquely containing uh, about 200 billion stars. And this is a typical uh, big galaxy. Um, here is, is another one, so-called Whirlpool. And this is a, a map uh, showing uh, the galaxies in a range of latitudes within 400 billion light years. We see that they're, they're grouped together in clusters and a sort of web-like structure. But how much can we actually understand about galaxies. Physicists who study particles, they can probe them, crash them together in accelerators, but astronomers can't crash real galaxies together. And moreover, galaxies change so slowly that in a human lifetime, we only see a snapshot of each of them. But we can do experiments in a speeded up virtual universe. Computer simulations incorporating gravity and gas dynamics uh, can then make movies of virtual collisions. And this shows a sort of train wreck when two galaxies merge, merge together. And indeed, I should warn you that this is going to happen to our galaxy and Andromeda in about four billion years, four billion. And this, here, this is a real image of two galaxies. And having done simulations like the one I showed on the, on, the, on the last slide, we can infer that these two galaxies have got dangerously close to each other. And uh, one is pulling out a tidal plume on the other. And probably if we could come back in a hundred million years, we would find that these had probably merged um, rather like the end point of that movie I just showed you. And we can redo simulations, making different assumptions about the mass of stars and gas in each galaxy and so forth, and see which simulation matches the data best. And this is the way we can test our theories and our models. And importantly, we find by this method and many others that all galaxies are held together by the gravity 
not just as the stars and gas we see. They're embedded in a swarm of particles which are invisible, but which collectively contribute about five times as much mass as the ordinary atoms. And this, of course, is the famous dark matter. We can also test ideas on how galaxies evolve, because we can actually do better than geologists, we can actually observe the past. This is a picture, a deep field, which shows galaxies uh, in a small area of sky, uh, about a hundredth of the area of the full moon in the sky, and these hundreds of smudges are galaxies, some of them so far away that the light's taken more than 10 billion years to get to us. And so what we can do is by uh, taking these pictures, we can look at what galaxies were like, not just now, but 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion years ago. And so subject our theories of how galaxies form and how they're clustered to quite stringent tests and know whether we are on the right lines. And we can go back a very long way. This object there, which you can hardly see, is one of the most distant objects in the sky. It's so far away that it's redshift stretches the wavelength of light by 8.1. And uh, the Lyman alpha line of hydrogen, uh, which is normally in far ultraviolet, 1216 angstroms, is on the left here in the near infrared. So you can think of the Doppler effect or how much the universe has stretched in its scale between when the light set out and when the light was here. And so when we look at this galaxy, we're looking back to a time when um, the universe was about 10 times younger than it is now. This particular object, incidentally, was singled out because it's much brighter than normal galaxy, because it's what's called a quasar. It's an object where all the light of the stars is outshone by light emitted by gas swirling into a massive black hole. This is just an artist's impression of how gas swirling into a black hole gets very, very hot and uh, emits lots of light, which heats up all the gas in the galaxy and uh, produces more luminosity by a factor of 100 than all the stars in the galaxy. So one of the best probes we have of very distant parts of the universe is looking for these quasars. Incidentally, our own galaxy harbors at its center a black hole of around 4 million solar masses, and uh, the best work on that has been done uh, using the um, uh, VLT, the European uh, telescopes in Chile. And also on news, in the new paper last year, we had this picture, which was uh, uh, a picture showing um, uh, the gas around a very big black hole weighing 6 billion times the sun in a other galaxy. And we do think that most uh, um, stars, sorry, most galaxies do have central black holes. And black holes, of course, are one of the most remarkable consequences of Einstein's theory of relativity. And I've got a quote here from the great astrophysicist Chandrasekhar, who is expressing uh, how amazed he is that exact solutions of Einstein's equations describe these objects which exist in the universe, in particular, as we now know, in the centers of uh, galaxies. And all these objects are described by a set of equations worked out by this man, Roy Kerr, Kerr a New Zealander in the early 1960s. He found this solution. He had no idea then that this would describe many of the most remarkable features of the universe in exact detail. Well, if we go back to the 1960s, um, when Kerr did this work, cosmology uh, was still in a rather primitive state. We didn't have these very high relative observations. Uh, we had models for the universe um, dating back to the 1920s for a homogeneous universe, but we didn't know if the universe really was homogeneous uh, in the sense required by those models. And we didn't indeed know if there was a Big Bang or not. Let's show this picture. This shows uh, Fred Hoyle on the left, who thought that the um, universe was in a steady state. 
existing for, from everlasting to everlasting, with new galaxies forming in the gaps as the old ones moved apart. And the one on the right is, uh, is Lemaitre, who was a Belgian priest, who was one of the first people to discuss the physics of a Big Bang, if there was one. And at the time this picture was taken, it is the late 1950s, um, it wasn't clear which of them was right, because it wasn't then possible to observe objects far enough away to discriminate between a steady state and a genuine evolution. <clears throat> but of course, the clinching event for most of us came in 1965, <clears throat> when these two people, Penges and Wilson, discovered that intergalactic space wasn't completely cold, it was warm to about three degrees above absolute zero by microwaves pervading all of space. And later evidence showed that these microwaves had a very exact black body spectrum. They're the <clears throat> afterglow of creation, as it were, the cooled and diluted relic of the universe's hot, dense beginning. And this is one of the pieces of evidence which transformed most people's beliefs to taking the Big Bang seriously. And uh, that's been the situation now. And uh, this is a time chart, very familiar. Um, and uh, uh, when we, we, we can look back 90% of the time, when we look at galaxies, the last scattering of the background radiation was when the universe was about 0.03% uh, of its present age. And we also incidentally have pretty good evidence of what the universe was like when it was a few seconds old, because the nuclear reactions that turn hydrogen to helium and deuterium would have operated then, and we can calculate the proportions that would emerge, and that agrees with what we find now. So there's a pretty good evidence uh, for the um, uh, for, for the fact that the uh, universe started off as a hot, dense beginning. But let's address an issue that might have seemed puzzling. Our present complex cosmos manifests a huge range of temperatures and densities, from blazingly hot stars to the dark night sky. And people sometimes worry about how this complexity emerged from an amorphous fireball. It might seem to violate the second law of thermodynamics, which describes an inexorable tendency for patterns and structures to decay. But that picture I've just been showing indicates a simulation of what actually happens during the expanding universe. The answer to the paradox lies in the force of gravity, because gravity enhances density contrasts and doesn't wipe them out. So any patch in the universe that's a slightly denser than average will lag behind and eventually condense out as the universe expands. And many simulations like the one I just showed have been made of a part of a virtual universe, modeling a domain large enough to make thousands of galaxies. And the calculations reveal how incipient structure unfolds and evolves. And within each galaxy scale clump, gravity enhances the contrast still further. Gas is pulled in and compressed into stars. But there's one very important point. In these simulations, the initial fluctuations fed into the computer model aren't arbitrary. They're derived from the observations in the temperature of the microwave background, which come from very early eras. This is a projection of the whole sky showing the temperature in different directions. Um, the, uh, the color code doesn't matter, but the main point is that the temperature is fairly uniform, but differs by about one part in 100,000, 10 to the minus five, from place to place. So there are sort of ripples, and we can, uh, we can calculate by putting those ripples in the uh, initial condition of simulation that gravity and gas dynamics, starting from this, do end up with the universe with galaxies and clusters like we see. And this is one of the great triumphs, I think, of uh, uh, cosmology in the last 30 years. To have this link between what we can observe in the linear regime back there and in the nonlinear regime today. And incidentally, um, this picture shows, in effect, ripples in the universe on different scales. And they're not uniform. It's not like white noise. There's a lot of structure in them. And this famous picture uh, is, uh, is, I think, one of the most remarkable pictures in the whole of, the whole of science. Um, it shows the um, amplitude 
on different uh, on different wavelengths. The, the long wavelengths on the left, short wavelengths on the right. And the uh, <clears throat> there's a parameter which which you can adjust, um, but the data can be fitted to this wiggly curve. And uh, this, I think, is a, is a remarkable prediction because uh, Peebles and others calculated this curve uh, in the 1970s, um, and uh, it's been fitted. And not only is it gratifying that it fits, but you can actually use this, this set of data, if you knew nothing else, to learn things like the density of dark matter in the universe, density of atoms in the universe, and maybe even the Hubble constant. So this is one of the most important diagrams in, in cosmology. Well, those are great successes, but what about things we don't yet understand? We don't understand what caused the fluctuations. Why does the universe have this uh, overall uniformity, but these fairly small amplitude fluctuations superposed on it? Why does the universe expand the way it does? And why does it contain the observed mix of atoms, radiation, and dark matter? We can trace back to one second when helium and deuterium formed. Indeed, I think we can probably be confident of the Big Bang back to about a nanosecond. I say a nanosecond because that's the time when every particle would have about the energy of particles that you can produce in the biggest accelerators. But in order to answer these questions, you have to go back much, much further still. <clears throat> when the universe was about a nanosecond old, the entire observable universe would be the size of our solar system. But many people think that in order to answer some of these questions, you've got to go back much, much further still. And I put a hazard sign here because we are far less confident now. And the theory of inflation, you've probably all, all heard of, suggests that uh, we have to go back to a time when our observable universe was not merely the size of a solar system, but the size of an apple. And that if that's the case, uh, then the fluctuations may have originated from quantum fluctuations when the universe was even of microscopic size. This is um, a, 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 an idea which has been um, studied for 40 years in variance, and it's not battle tested, but it's supported by quite a bit of evidence and explains some of the mysteries I just showed on the last slide. It's amazing if we can really show that the fluctuations are generated back at this tiny, tiny initial instant by quantum effects. Well, now just a digression to talk about the future of the universe. The three scenarios, is it time plotted upwards, universe that recollapses to a big crunch, universe that goes on expanding, it decelerates because everything exerts a gravitational pull on everything else, and it will slow down in this expansion, even if it may not stop. Whether it stops or not depends on a so-called critical density. Or the third possibility, which is that um, there's another force, which Einstein first uh, speculated about, which makes the expansion start to accelerate. And it was thought until the late 1990s that we were in a universe like the middle because dark matter and atoms contributed about 30% as much as would be needed to bring the expansion to a halt, make it recollapse. But it ought to go and decelerate. But it turned out, and um, Adam Rice, who's here, was one of the uh, people who did this, uh, that the universe had been accelerating for at least the last five billion years. Gravitational attraction is seemingly overwhelmed by a mysterious new force latent in empty space, which pushes galaxies away from each other. And the prime evidence which they had came from measuring the brightness and recession speeds of distant supernovae. But this was just 
a key element in a network of arguments. Um, the, and the other argument came from uh, looking at this big peak here in this spectrum. This big peak corresponds to a uh, sound wave, as it were, whose scale is about the size of the universe um, at the time the radiation was last scattered. It's like a sort of rigid rod, and you can calculate how big it is. Now, if the universe had nothing in it except 30% of the critical density in material, uh, then it would have a hyperbolic geometry. The angle of triangles would be um, less than 180 degrees. And this feature would appear on a smaller angular scale. So looking at this picture and knowing that there's not enough ordinary stuff to make the universe flat, you would infer that there must be something else, something uniform, which is making a difference. And moreover, that's something else had to be exotic because it had to be less important in the past than now. It had to have a negative pressure and that meant that it uh, caused an acceleration. And I try to illustrate this here um, at the bottom right, there's the, the evidence from the supernovae. But even if we hadn't had that, we could have inferred uh, from uh, um, looking at the Doppler peak that uh, the universe must be dominated uh, by this energy latent in empty space. Now, another basic question. How much space is there altogether? How extensive is physical reality? We can only see a finite volume, a finite number of galaxies. That's essentially because it's a horizon, the shell around us, delineating the distance light can have traveled since the Big Bang. In our accelerating universe, it's what's called an event horizon. The redshift of any distant galaxy increases, if you go on watching it, and it eventually disappears, rather like something falling into a black hole. So this is sort of horizon around us, a sort of shell. But that shell's got no more physical reality than the circle around us, which represents the horizon if we're on a boat in the middle of the ocean. So unless we take a very sort of non-Copernical view, there are galaxies already beyond the horizon, which we can never see, even in principle. We don't know how many there are, but because there's no perceptible gradient between one side of the universe and the other, that suggests that the universe, if it's finite, is much, much bigger than the reason we can observe. And it could be far bigger. It could go on so far that uh, all combinatorial options are fulfilled. And uh, we would be another Earth, and uh, we would have avatars, and it might comfort us that uh, if we make some bad decision, our avatar far beyond the horizon has made the right decision. But even conservative astronomers are confident that the volume of space time within range of our telescopes, what astronomers have traditionally called the observable universe, is only a tiny fraction of the aftermath of our Big Bang. And there's something else. Some models, like uh, Andre Linde's eternal inflation, and I show the cartoon here, suggests that our Big Bang could be just one island of space time in a vast archipelago. One Big Bang among many. So, sh shown here is um, uh, our, our horizon, galaxy before that, and uh, they're part of one sort of vast bubble, one of many. And I should say that this is speculation, um, it's based on specific assumptions about what the physics would be like at this very early inflationary stage, but we've no idea if that's a correct physics. But a challenge for 21st century physics is to see which branch of this decision tree is the right one. First, are there many big bangs or just one? Second, if there are many, are they all governed by the same physics or not? Many string theorists argue that there could be a huge number of different vacuum states, different vacuum energies with different microphysics. And what we call the laws of nature could in this grander perspective be just local bylaws governing our cosmic patch. And different big bangs could cool down differently. 
Well, if physical reality is like this, then there's a real motivation to explore these counterfactual universes with different gravity, different microphysics and so forth, to explore, explore what range of parameters would allow complexity to emerge. And this is what's called anthropic selection. And I should say that some physicists foam at the mouth at the mention of the A word. But we may have to take it into account if Linde's theory or something like it is correct. But quite apart from the anthropic motivation, um, I think it's quite interesting to explore what physical laws are particularly sensitive in their application to our universe. What would it be like if we tweaked the laws a bit? And so what I want to do is to give some examples of this tweaking. Because even if it's not relevant to uh, uh, an actual multiverse, some theorists find it helps to develop their intuition to explore what would happen if the laws or parameters were different from the actual values. It's like counterfactual history, where scholars speculate on what might have happened to to uh, the United States and Britain if the Brits had fought better in 1776 and kept the US as a colony. And biologists speculate on how our biosphere might have evolved differently if the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out. So perhaps in that spirit, um, you'll forgive me if I mention some counterfactual universes. First, what about a universe with different gravity? This is a familiar pedagogical diagram, which um, many people have used, and Bernard Carr and I developed this 40 years ago. Um, and uh, it's interesting because it shows in the log log plot, length scale on the bottom and mass going up. So you can see black holes, a line of slope one in the diagram. You can see a proton, the bottom, hydrogen atom, larger than the proton, about the same mass. And you can see, uh, going up from the hydrogen atom, you can see um, uh, solid objects of roughly the same density. Their radius or their length scale goes as the cube root of their mass. So we go up there. And so let's imagine we go up, we have sugar, sugar lumps, humans and asteroids, etc., cetera. Um, and uh, uh, the radius goes as the cube root of the mass. But when we get up to something the size of a planet, then gravity becomes strong enough to have an effect and make them round. And when we get up to the mass of Jupiter, gravity can actually start to crush something above solid densities. And then we get to the realm of the stars. And this is a neat picture and it shows the stars and the stars have a, a characteristic mass, uh, which is a three hours power of the uh, uh, ratio of the uh, electrical to the gravitational force uh, times the mass of a proton. And one other point I'd mention is that uh, gravity is very weak and that's manifested by the fact that a black hole, the size of a proton, has a mass of about 10 to 38 protons. So what would happen if gravity was not quite so weak? This diagram would have more or less the same shape, but gravity would come in before you'd cram together so many particles. So you get, you get stars and planets, but they'd be much, much smaller. and They'd last less long. Conversely, if we make gravity weaker, then stars will be bigger and longer lived. But there's no particular reason why the first order, they wouldn't be the same. And in fact, people like Fred Adams have done more detailed calculations, so in the respect to which they are different, but basically you can imagine changing gravity uh, by two powers of 10 either way and see what happens. If you make gravity stronger, 
then you get a more constricted and shorter lived universe. But if you make gravity weaker by say a factor of a hundred, then stars will be heavier by a factor of a thousand and they'd live a hundred times longer. And then the other thing you can ask is uh, what would galaxies do in this picture? And this is a, a technical point that I can't go into, but in the simplest model, galaxies scale the same way. So if you had a value of big G, the gravitational constant, 100 times less than it actually is, you'd have stars a thousand times more massive and galaxies ditto, so roughly the same number of stars in a galaxy. So you get a large uh, universe. And the only thing that would change is that actually you get uh, um, uh, le less helium in the universe because the expansion rate would be slower at a given temperature in the early Big Bang. And so you wouldn't uh, get the, 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 um, the same um, proportion of primordial elements, but other things will be the first order more or less the same. So uh, the point I want to make is that G must be weak in order to give you many powers of 10 between the micro scale and the, uh, uh, the, and the scale and having things like us not being crossed by gravity. Um, but there's nothing optimal about the present value. The universe might be much more interesting if G was still weaker and you could have more, more space and time. But let's, let me ask about a second number that I've mentioned uh, only implicitly. Um, I mentioned that the universe has this initial sort of roughness, this turbulence, and the amplitude of this is about 10 to the minus 5. This is a number I call Q. And you can ask, what would happen if the universe was either smoother or rougher than this? This factor Q, it determines um, uh, how long it takes for structures to condense out, how gravitationally bound they are when they do um, condense out, and it also determines how the um, uh, uh, how big the largest clusters are. So just to go through this very quickly, um, there's an uh, what I call an, an anemic universe. If Q is ten to minus six less, then it would take a long time for galaxies to form. They'd have rather shallow potential wells. Star formation might be difficult, etc., and they might not keep their heavy elements. So that uh, is well a, a dull universe, but if you make Q 10 times higher, 10 to minus four, then you get a rather more interesting and exciting universe because what would happen then is that masses as big as the present cluster of galaxy would condense out early in the universe at a redshift of 10. And instead of breaking up into galaxies, they'd make huge disk galaxies. So you'd have huge disk galaxies weighing 10 to 14 solar masses forming there. And this again will be an interesting universe. Uh, the only um, feature that's not conducive to life is the stars are a bit closer together and then they are in our universe uh, too much. If on the other hand, uh, the universe is too rough, 10 to minus three, uh, then you would form massive black holes early on and you probably wouldn't form any stars at all. Um, and uh, uh, going a bit further, uh, then you get to a model where you couldn't really, with confidence, apply the standard equation but assume things are homogeneous. We're lucky in a sense that uh, um, the universe is smooth. Um, it's rather like an, an ocean where even the largest wave is small compared to the horizon distance. So you can take averages. Um, if Q were 10 to minus three or larger, the analysis would be not with an ocean, but with a mountain landscape where a few features can dominate the view and you can't really talk about averages. So cosmology would be much harder uh, if uh, Q were uh, more than 10 to minus three, but uh, um, intelligence probably couldn't exist then anyway. <clears throat> I should mention that uh, uh, in this exercise, I'm varying the numbers one at a time. You can have more fun if you try and vary two of them. Uh, varying the, the cosmological constant of repulsion and others, and uh, uh, it's easy to do that. I've got no time for that now. But let me now uh, ask about another thing. Um, uh, what about the microphysics? Uh, we know that uh, um, getting nuclear fuel for stars requires that uh, heavy elements should be more tightly bound than hydrogen and helium. We've got a binding curve like that uh, to get a periodic table. 
Um, people like Fred Adams have worked out what would happen if you tune this differently. But let me just take a very extreme case. Uh, let's uh, take, take what I call the nuclear free universe. Let's suppose that there's only hydrogen, no strong interaction and no complex nuclei. Uh, and so this nuclear free universe um, would be quite interesting. Um, let's leave everything else the same. Uh, stars would still form, be hydrogen gas to cool down. Uh, they'd form, but there'd be no nuclear fuel. So they'd go on contracting until they became white dwarfs. And a hydrogen white dwarf has 5.6 solar masses. So the stars below 5.6 solar masses would condense to be white dwarfs. And Jupiter-like planets could exist around them. Now, heavy stars would leave black holes behind them and uh, it's not quite clear how much energy you get out of them. It depends on whether the gas falls straight in or swirls around. But the bottom line here is that the total amount of energy you get in this universe would not be all that different, so not all that much less than in our universe, because the binding energy of a white dwarf is not much uh, less than the energy you get from nu nuclear fusion in the sun. Uh, and so uh, this universe would, rather, would look rather like um, our universe would have stars, and galaxies, and even giant planets, um, but it would have no chemistry, no rocky planets, no life. Indeed, the only intelligence you could imagine is something like Fred Hoyle's black cloud, where you have a big magnetized cloud with a lot of complexity there. Uh, so uh, this universe um, is not one where life could exist. It bears the same relation to the actual universe that a marble statue does to a real human being. But it's amusing to speculate on, uh, on this sort of thing. So um, just a few remarks before I conclude. I want to go back and ask um, uh, if there was a multiverse, then what would it mean for our view of the laws of nature? It might mean that they're not unique and that they are in some sense arbitrary. And I show Kepler because Kepler, as you will realize, uh, he thought that the planets moved in circles and that their orbits were in ratios determined by the platonic regular solids. He had this lovely idea. Now, we don't believe in this now, uh, if only because we don't think that the Earth's orbit is a fundamental thing. We believe it's determined by lots of accidents. And in some of these uh, uh, complex universes, we may uh, think that the laws are rather arbitrary. And so, uh, and so we wouldn't expect uh, the laws that govern our nature, our universe to be all, all that special. And of course, some people don't like the concept of the inflationary universe in Linde's sense, because it would render the hope for neat explanations of the fundamental physical numbers as vain as uh, Kepler's numerological quest to understand the solar system. But our preferences are irrelevant to the way physical reality actually is. So I think we should be open-minded to the possibility of what I'd call the fourth and grandest Copernican revolution. We've had the Copernican revolution itself, then the realization that there are zillions of planetary systems in our galaxy, then that there are zillions of galaxies in our observable universe. But we then realize that our observable domain is a tiny part of a far larger and possibly diverse assembly, maybe as complex as something biological. Well, is this a scientific question? Some people say this is all metaphysics. I would say it's speculative science, but the only way this idea, or indeed any idea about the ultra universe, will be put on a firm basis, will be if we can formulate theories which apply to those very extreme conditions, when you build the universe is the size of, a, of, a, of an apple, and if those theories can be tested or vindicated in the everyday world. If we had a theory which could explain why the three kinds of neutrinos and various other things, it would gain credibility. And then we would 
apply it to the early universe and see what it predicted. You don't have to be able to test all the predictions of a theory. Take Einstein's relativity. Uh, we don't know what it's like inside a black hole, but we believe what, what Einstein's theory predicts about the inside of a black hole, which we've tested the theory in many other contexts. And likewise, if we had a theory which applied to the inflationary era, but we tested in a low energy world, then we take it seriously. And if it predicts the multiverse, then we would take that seriously. And so I think that's the state we're in, but we're not there yet. In fact, about 10 years ago, I was on a panel at Stanford where we were asked how much we'd bet on the multiverse concept. Of course, it is just a bet now because we've got no idea. And I said that on the scale, would you bet your goldfish, your dog or your life? I was nearly at, do at the dog level. And Andre Linde, who by then spent 25 years promoting his eternal inflation, he said he'd almost bet his life. And later on being told this, the great theorist Steven Weinberg said he'd happily bet Martin Rees's dog and Andre Linde's life. Well, Andre Linde, my dog and I will all be dead before this is settled, but it's not metaphysics. It's highly speculative, but it's exciting science and it may be true. And just to conclude by coming back closer to the uh, real world, um, I'd want to emphasize that most progress in cosmology and astrophysics has been due to advanced instruments and technology, less than 5% to armchair theory. And I'd expect that balance to continue, but there's one big change, which is that computer simulations have hugely advanced in power and in range. And I think that's something which, 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 which does uh, make a big difference, but it's the, uh, it's the instruments uh, which are going to make the difference. And here's a uh, sort of um, collection of five ones which you all know about. We've already got Alma and the others are on their way. And it's these plus more powerful computers for analyzing the data and for doing simulations, which uh, make us uh, hopeful. I'm of, of the ancient vintage from the 1960s, which were exhilarating for young astrophysicists. Because so much was new that the old guys didn't have a big head start over the youngsters. But I'm not going to be nostalgic because there are some students and postdocs listening here, and I want to emphasize that today is an even better time for young researchers. The pace of advance has crescendoed and not slackened. Instrumentation and computer power have improved hugely. And on that encouraging note, um, I'd offer a quote from Hubble. There he is, a heavy smoker, as you can see. He said, only when empirical resources are exhausted should we enter the dreamy realm of speculation. So young people who want to do astronomy should be encouraged. But just a final word for people in the audience who may be from other walks of life. They may ask, does contemplation of these topics change our perspective on our life here on Earth? And I think it does. It does this by offering a perspective on an immense future, as well as an immense past. The Earth existed for four and a half billion years. It's less than halfway through its life. And our universe itself has a far longer future. But even in the context of a concertina timeline, extending billions of years into the future, as well as into the past, this century is special. It's the first when one species, the human species, has the planet's future in its hands. And our creative intelligence could create billions of years of evolution here on Earth and far beyond, even more marvelous than what's led to us. On the other hand, humans could trigger bio, psycho, or environmental catastrophes which foreclose all these potentialities. So our Earth, this uh, pale blue dot in the cosmos, is a special place, and we're its stewards at a specially crucial time, what some people call the Anthropocene. And that's a key message for all of us, I think, whether or not we're astronomers. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for this wonderful talk. We're going to take 120 seconds of uh, cool down time.
to sort our thoughts and uh, go through the Q&A questions. So everyone is encouraged to put their comments and questions in the Q&A and we will resume when the music is over. Okay, so let's begin. Thank you again, Martin, for this wonderful overview. So let's start with the first question from Franz. Great, thank, thank you very much, Martin, for this talk. Um, so this actually mirrors a question that Hans Zinniger uh, sort of had. And in your title, you mentioned the frustration of cosmology, but maybe you can clarify that a little bit because I never felt like you, you were actually very frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, I mean, I think we know that uh, everything goes in, uh, in exciting bursts and then levels off. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the, uh, and some subjects stagnate for some time and others come in. Um, I think um, it is uh, salutary that the inflationary story is now 40 years old. Uh, for for our, our students today, the idea of inflation is as far in the past as Schrodinger and Heisenberg were when my generation was a student. So I think we can be slightly disappointed that uh, we haven't made the breakthroughs um, in the, the very high energy physics there. Um, but on the other hand, um, entirely new subjects have, uh, have developed like um, gravitational waves and of course exoplanets and all these. So I, I think um, uh, we've got nothing to grumble about, but clearly we want to know uh, um, just as in 50 years, we've gone from uh, not knowing if it's a big bang at all to knowing with great confidence about its properties. Uh, will 50 years from now, people be as confident about the first uh, 10 to minus 36 seconds? I hope so, but we can't be sure. Okay, so let's go to the Q&A. And we have um, at the very top, uh, a question by Xavier Hernandez, and he's asking, the continual non-detection of dark matter particles has prompted renewed interest in alternative dark matter options, some of which are by construction indetectable, like brain world scenarios where dark matter, the driving causal entity in the model, is applying length away, but often in an inaccessible direction. What is your opinion of models where dark matter is something which we must assume will remain without a direct, direct empirical confirmation of existence even. Yes, well, obviously it would be far better if we could detect the particles and it's good so to continue. But I think, um, uh, as I briefly mentioned, um, uh, in order to take an idea seriously, it's got to be a consequence of a theory which has been tested in many other ways. So uh, if, if there's a, um, a theory which uh, has been tested um, and helps her to understand things in our low energy world. And then also um, predicts this dark matter, that's fine. But I think if there's no empirical test, then that is bad news. But as I say, uh, I, I'm hopeful that if there is a grand unified theory of some kind, um, it will allow us to uh, apply it to the physics at the inflationary phase, but it may also um, uh, illuminate some of the uh, uncertain constants of the standard model and things like that. And if that's the case, then we've got reasons for taking it seriously. So I think uh, the, the key thing is we've got to have a theory which is uh, uh, corroborated by some real data or real experiments. But then if that's been done, then we can uh, um, take quite seriously its implications, even when we can't directly test those implications. Okay, I see Elizabeth has a question. Yes. Uh, there is a question here also in the Q&A from uh, Rubayat Khan. And he said, uh, what is one legendary theory or idea that you haven't think or of ever in your early career, but now is potentially logical? One which is, um, which is logical now. Yes, and before it was a bit crazy, maybe. <laughs> um, well, I, I, well, I, I think I think perhaps the um, exoplanets. Of course, um, uh, they weren't they weren't a, a huge surprise because there were there is a star formation which suspected uh, which that there should be um, planet formation. But I think the range and variety 
of exoplanets is something which uh, no one could confidently have predicted. And that's an exciting development. And of course, uh, we can't predict how quickly particular developments will take place. Um, uh, sometimes we have big surprises. Um, in the 1960s, there were lots of surprises. Neutron stars and black holes were surprises. And uh, uh, we have some others, but uh, uh, I think it's, it, there's nothing which is a complete surprise and it goes against the uh, laws that we accepted at that time. I see that Jim has a comment. Beautiful talk, Martin. I wanted just to remark on your comment that if the dark matter is not detected one way or another, it is trouble. I don't see that at all. We yeah. now have no evidence for non-baryonic dark matter except the variety of tests, a few of which you mentioned. And you knew, of course, there are a whole lot more. They make a case for the Lambda CDM theory, not as exact reality, if there's such a thing, but a very good approximation that I think is already compelling, simply mm -hmm. through the checks of the predictive power of Lambda CDM. Yes. It means that we have a compelling case now and if we don't ever detect the dark matter, the case gets no worse. It's already compelling. No, I, I, I would agree with that. It would still be nice to know what it was, um, but I think um, I, I'm, not, I'm not the slightest bit worried that we haven't detected it yet because um, there's about uh, um, uh, 12 powers of 10 between the uh, um, highest energy you can get in a uh, accelerator and the Planck scale. And anywhere there, there could be particles. So um, I think the parameter space where particles could exist is uh, very wide. So I agree with that. And also there are these more exotic options. Um, and so I certainly uh, would uh, agree with you. And I wouldn't want to tinker with uh, relativity, as some people do. And uh, I don't know if you agree, agree with that, that uh, you don't want to um, change the, the laws of gravity to uh, account for these effects. Mm -hmm. Well, could I just reply that I don't see any harm in tinkering with gravity or with, for example, adding a little bit of space curvature, even though that's contrary to inflation. Right. Uh, but yeah. given mm. how successful the theory is now, how predictive, I look for adjustments and I'm hoping perhaps the Hubble constant problem is such an indication of the need for an adjustment. I just don't see the prospect for another revolution mm -hmm. that eliminates something that acts like dark matter. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, no I, 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 I agree with this. And of course, um, uh, um, one thing which I've said when I've written about this is that uh, when the history of science um, in this period is written, then one of the most exciting and, uh, and important development will be uh, those which, in fact, you have spearheaded to actually understand the present universe um, by linking it to what the early universe was like. And this is a great achievement, which is up there with the standard model and the human genome and plate tectonics as a great achievement. And I think uh, uh, it is uh, going to um, survive, um, although it's going to be refined and tinkered with, but the basic structure I think is going to stand. Um, but um, uh, that, that's all, all I want to say. Um, and, but of course the nonlinear part is going to be a perpetual challenge to understand the, the details and the computer simulations can help, but uh, not enough. I fully agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to Eric next. So combining together a, a few of the, the questions we've gotten, as far as getting information on inflation of various possibilities such as the cosmic microwave background, polarization, um, detection of some signature primordial black hole, direct laser interferometer measurements, or what, what Jim just mentioned, seeing a signature of, um, of, of spatial curvature. Mm -hmm. Which do you think is going to um, occur first and which do you think will be most informative? Well, I mean, I. I... I'm not an expert, I wouldn't venture that. We want to try try them all. Um, and I mean, not non-Gaussianity is another one which mentioned. Um, but uh, I, I think we should look for the polarization, obviously. 
um, and, and, and all these others, um, because what that will do is narrow down the possible um, details of the physics at that era. Adam. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I guess my question is to Martin and to Jim as well, um, which is um, for Lambda CDM, it, it, in your estimation, is that this all there is? Um, Jim was raising this before, uh, whether there are revolutions left or whether there are incremental adjustments left, do you think there, there is more about Lambda CDM or do you think we pretty much have it? Mm. Um, well, if, if I answer first, um, uh, I, I think there'll be refinements um, and, of course, maybe a deeper understanding of it if we knew what the dark matter was. But again, uh, uh, I, I think um, there'll be no major changes because it does work very well. Uh, all the uncertainties are really arising because the gas dynamics and star formation and feedback is so complicated. Um, but I think there's no uh, showstopper. And so I think we should stick with it. Of course, I still think that um, uh, I'd like to know if there is a multiverse and we'll only know that uh, if we understand um, whether, um, there, whether um, Linde's type of theory or some other one is, is correct. And perhaps at that stage, we will know what the dark energy is. We haven't mentioned the dark energy yet. And uh, I feel that we won't understand the nature of the dark energy until we have um, a complete quantum gravity or something like that, because I think everyone would agree that space is not a continuum down to a zero scale, but the graininess of space is on the Planck scale, which is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's the scale uh, where gravity and quantum uncertainty meet. And uh, uh, on, that's the scale on which string theory and all these things operate. And so until we understand the graininess of space and its structure on those scales, I don't think we're going to understand what the so-called dark energy is. And uh, that's a big challenge. And so I'm not very optimistic about that happening quickly. Indeed, if it's a string theory of some kind, uh, which applies, um, then this may be an interesting uh, instance where only AI can actually help us with the answers. Because if the theory is something that depends on geometry in 10 or 11 dimensions, then it may be just too complicated for humans to work through. And so the only way we'll know whether the theory is correct is if some AI can do all those calculations and come out at the end spewing out the correct mass for the proton or something like that. So we never get this sort of insight, but we may learn if the theory is correct there. And if we know um, if the theory is correct, we can then with some confidence um, ask, does it have the conditions needed for the multiverse or not? Joe, please go. Well, since uh, uh, Adam and Barry Mador and other participants in the uh, Hubble parameter uh, debate are uh, present, uh, let me ask Martin, uh, what do you think of uh, the uh, two problems that uh, people are uh, pretty familiar with uh, concerning tensions in Lambda CDM? One is the Hubble parameter tension uh, that uh, graph that you showed, uh, Martin, uh, showing the great uh, agreement between the temperature distribution and uh, the predictions of lambda CDM, tells us that the Hubble parameter today is 67 plus or minus about 0. 0.5, mm -hmm. whereas the local measurements uh, are mostly coming out around 73, as Adam has emphasized. Mm -hmm. uh, the other problem that people are concerned with is uh, the sigma eight problem that basically uh, the degree of uh, fluctuations, which is related to the Q parameter that you talked about and uh, the weak lensing results uh, are producing uh, a discrepancy that may be as large as uh, uh, four sigma. Uh, so these could of course just be systematic effects or other misinterpretations of the data uh, I personally take very seriously the Hubble parameter one. What do you think? Yes, I the same. I think the, the, the other one you mentioned, the sigma eight, et cetera, I suspect that that is because 
the feedback effect from galaxies um, uh, on the distribution of gas and indeed of dark matter is very hard to, to simulate and we've probably not got that right. And so I think there's some slack there. Um, as regards the uh, Hubble um, discrepancy, I mean, I'm intimidated because the three sort of high priests of that are, are here. Um, and, um, uh, but uh, I do talk to my local guru who is George Estathew, um, who uh, uh, suspects that there may be some uh, uh, um, extra systematic uncertainties uh, in the photometry, etc. cetera. Um, I hope there really is a discrepancy because that would indeed um, do what uh, um, neither Jim nor I think is likely and require a real um, uh, new input, a real revolution in our ideas. But I think if you ask me to bet, I will bet that the uh, resolution will be found to be underestimation of errors and will come out closer to the um, um, micro background limit. That's, that's my, my, my guess. Um, but uh, uh, incidentally, I, I think um, I recommend people to look at the papers and uh, I think it's a very well-conducted controversy because if you look at a paper by George Estathew, which came out in August, he had some criticisms and um, the response of, um, of, of Wendy and Adam is interleaved into his preprint. And so that's a very nice way you can understand the development of controversy. There have been further steps since then, um, but I, I, I'm hopeful that there will be some convergence. If you ask me to bet, um, I, I will bet that it will end up closer to the uh, CMB value. Let's go okay. to Paula next. Yes, there are some questions from the Q&A. One is from Giuseppe Dago. He says, in which topic do you expect or do you hope to see the next groundbreaking discovery in astrophysics? Um, well, I think um, it's not hopeless to think we'll find some evidence for um, vegetation on an exoplanet within 10 years. And, uh, uh, and or even perhaps um, something on uh, Enceladus. I mean, I, I mentioned that uh, um, under the ice of Enceladus there's an ocean and some people think there could be some, some life there. Um, and I think it's very worthwhile, not just to uh, use big telescopes to study exoplanet spectra and see if we can see the red edge and all that, um, but um, to actually explore um, our outer planets because if we found even the simplest kind of life um, on Enceladus or Europa or somewhere like that, then that would immediately tell us that life wasn't a rare fluke. If it could have emerged twice independently in one planetary system, then we'd know straight away that it existed in maybe a hundred million places in our galaxy. The galaxy would have to teem with life. And that would be an amazing discovery. And uh, but at the moment, of course, we can't rule out the option that life is such a rare phenomenon that it exists here on Earth and nowhere else. So life being found anywhere would be, I think, the most important and exciting discovery. Slightly related to this, um, I'm going to pick off a few um, questions from the Q&A. And it's related to the talk that we will hear next week uh, by Avi Loeb, who is uh, an avid believer of Oumuamua being um, let's say a probe from an uh, intelligent uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. I think that's you know? systematic errors in the photometry. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Very, very well. Okay, uh, yes. Well, I mean, uh, uh, I read an interview with him in South American way where, where he, he accused other scientists of being ego driven. Uh, um, pots and kettles come to mind. Um, but, um, uh, but, but more seriously, um, I, I, first of all, I don't take his evidence seriously. And I think his book is damaging. And it's damaging because uh, he conflates the evidence he's putting forward for this particular case with the uh, likelihood of extraterrestrial life. He somehow thinks that all the rest of us are blinkered conservatives who aren't prepared to take seriously extraterrestrial life. Um, I think um, many of us um, uh, take it very seriously. We'd love to find it. But nonetheless, we think that his evidence is extremely feeble. And he has a tradition of uh, promoting the most newsworthy rather than the most plausible interpretation of any phenomenon. And that's the case here. So I think it's damaging because he is uh, um, uh, presenting a very feeble case for extraterrestrial technology. Um, and uh, uh, people may 
conflate that with uh, the case for looking for extraterrestrial life uh, or technology, because it's a very worthwhile search, um, but this particular evidence is very weak. And I think if that is the view of most of the other people who studied the subject. So it's really gaining lots of publicity for a very poor argument. And it, the book is selling very well, just as if I were to write a book uh, saying Astronomer Royal believes in astrology, that would be bestseller too. <laughs> okay, let's go to Barry now. Yeah, Martin, many years ago, uh, Martin Schwarzschild wrote an influential review of stellar evolution. And at the end, he pointed out that his computer simulations were actually running significantly slower than the stars were evolving. Uh, <laughs> these were these thermal pulses. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And in a Zen-like way at the end of that, he said, and once again, we are forced to think. <laughs> now, what do you think he meant by that? And if you have an opinion on it, because I, I mentioned this to another cosmologist, he said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And maybe you could instruct future students on how to approach cosmology and computer simulations and the, the new world of uh, astrophysics and how best to think. Yes. Well, I, I'd say that, uh, of course, computer simulations have advanced hugely yeah. in, and now do uh, um, you know 3d simulations with gas dynamics magnetic fields and all that so martin would be delighted were he still alive at what can be done uh, in stellar evolution but of course uh, i think his uh, point is still germane maybe even more so because um, there are lots of uh, simulations which are, are done um, and the programs are used by people who may not have developed them, may not understand them too well. And there is a risk um, that we depend too much on simulations. And uh, I, um, I do find, and I'm sure uh, others have had this experience, that um, uh, you, 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 when, when I look at the Astro PH every morning, you see papers about uh, uh, analysis of uh, star formation and correlation of galactic mass and black hole mass in some sample. And you discover that when you start to read the paper, that this is an analysis of a simulation, not of the real world at all. And so people can perhaps take too seriously these, these simulations and uh, get in a world where they uh, forget that there may be something fundamentally important which is missed out. So I think uh, uh, the warning of Martin Schwarzschild is probably even more germane now because computers are more powerful and simulations, um, like the one I had as my, my, my closing thing of the uh, fly through the universe. They're wonderful simulations um, of the filamentary structure of the universe, but we got to realize that uh, they're not the, the whole story and um, they may miss out something important. But of course, because we can't do experiments in astronomy, we do depend far more on uh, uh, simulations in a virtual world uh, than uh, experimental scientists do. Thanks. I'll, I'll go away and think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we should all think more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Alejandro next. Yes, mm. but but uh, but I do. But, but Barry, I, I do think that um, uh, there may be some physical problems, and um, l l like string theory, which may be correct, but they may just be too hard for the unaided human brain to ever actually grasp. So we we may hit the buffers there, but I think. I go back to my other point, which is that biology is far harder. And so uh, um, probably understanding the brain is going to be far harder than understanding anything in the physical world. Alejandro. Hi, uh, Dr. Wee. Uh, with, uh, regarding the possibility, the potential for extraterrestrial life, you mentioned twice uh, the prospect, a good prospect of Enceladus as a, a bearing life in the ocean under the ice. But you didn't mention Europa, the satellite of Jupiter, which is yes. sort of too closer to the sun. I mean, is there any particular reason for that or just oh God? Yeah, well, uh, uh, in fact, I cut a bit out of my talk on the, this topic because um, I, I think uh, I was thinking of sort of simple life under the ocean. Um, but um, uh, if we think about SETI and uh, et cetera, then um, 
let's let's imagine uh, what might happen in the future of of, uh, uh, of, the, of the Earth, the life on Earth. Then um, uh, let's suppose that Elon Musk et al. Uh, go to Mars. Let's suppose that there are big colonies there. Let's suppose that they um, uh, redesign themselves using genetic technology or even download themselves into uh, electronic intelligences, which they might. Then if that happens, then the electronic intelligences won't want to stay on Mars. Uh, they don't need an atmosphere. They may prefer zero G. So they will go off into the blue yonder. And um, if they're near immortal, then interstellar voyages won't deter them. And so uh, our remote progeny could be electronic, it could be near immortal. And that therefore uh, could be the long range future. And so now let's suppose that there was another earth like ours <laughs> where life had evolved in the same way as it has here for a billion years to get to intelligent life, then just a few millennia of technological civilization before the machines take over and then billions of years for them in the future. Then it's most unlikely that this other planet would be synchronized with us so that we would see it in this sliver of a few millennia where it was dominated by a civilization of, of uh, flesh and blood creatures like us. Either it'll be behind with no evidence or it will be up to a million years ahead, in which case we would not expect to see a civilization, but we might expect to see anywhere in space uh, some sort of electronic entities there. And uh, uh, so it could be that if SETI does detect something, or if Avi Loeb was right and it had already detected something, then that would be um, a burping or malfunctioning um, electronic entity left by some long dead civilization. But this also requires, I think, a rethinking of the Drake equation, because in the Drake equation, they put in the lifetime of a technological civilization, which um, normally takes to be a few centuries or millennium at most. That, this is a pessimistic conclusion, because if that civilization um, gets to the stage of being able to create electronic progeny, which then go out, then they're around for a billion years. And so if you look at it this way, then there is going to be far more chance of there being some sort of intelligences, electronic intelligences. Uh, now, it, when I give this argument, people say, well, does this make the Fermi paradox work? Why haven't we seen these, if, if there's so many of them? And my answer there is that evolution up to the present is Darwinian selection, which favors intelligence, but also favors aggression. But these entities, there's no reason why they might would be aggressive. They may be just thinking deep thoughts um, under some planetary ocean or in interstellar space. So uh, there's no particular reason why they should be uh, aggressive or territorial. And, uh, and so I don't think that the um, traditional Fermi paradox argument is an argument against their being uh, the progeny of literally millions of civilizations that started off on Earth-like planets now pervading the galaxy from uh, planets that had a one or two billion year head start over the Earth. I don't know, the men has answered your question. I don't know. I think that's my, question that's my perspective was, on this. You, you composed a beautiful speech, but my question was much, much <laughs> more mundane. I mean, why you didn't mention Europa together with Enceladus? Uh, for the prospect of simple life in the ocean. I mean, um, well, I, I, I just didn't have time to put it all in, really. Okay. But, uh, it's an important point. No, I, I thought that may, there might be a reason that I didn't know. I mean, that was, no, no. That was it. No. Okay. Anyway, thank you for your, right. your stay. That was a mistake. Oh, yes. Spoken stay. Paula has. Yes, there is another question from the Q&A from Jorge Cuadra. He says, I find the idea of an infinite universe having almost identical words to ours 
very interesting. But isn't the chaotic complexity of our world in a sense even more infinite than the universe size? Um, well, of course, if, if you were to have uh, um, all possible combinatorial options replicated, then the scale you need is absolutely immense. You know, uh, far bigger than the scale you need for monkeys to type out all the work of Shakespeare and all that. It's far, far bigger. It's uh, uh, an immense number, but in principle, it could happen. Um, but uh, it would require um, something far, far bigger than uh, most people would imagine. So it's, um, it, it's I think, not, not, not impossible. Um, and uh, indeed, it would be expected if the universe were big enough and extend far enough beyond our horizon, but it would have to extend so far that it's one of these numbers that you could, uh, you'd run out of ink if you tried to write out this number. So it's a, uh, it's a speculation and something which would be no chance of testing, because you'd have no chance of going far enough to actually meet your avatars. Okay, so there is um, one question that is in the Q&A floating around here, and I'm gonna again package this up into a meta question. So. <laughs> Um, someone is asking, uh, have you thought, I mean, you have heard probably Stephen Wolfram's idea of uh, the computational universe, right? Where there is a causality is basically the emergent, uh, let's say, aspect of reality and then everything else falls, falls out of that. What do you think about this? Yes. Um, uh, I haven't studied his theory enough to have a, uh, an informed opinion, um, but I do think that uh, we haven't reached um, the um, best or anywhere near final understanding of quantum mechanics. And indeed, there are lots of ideas about uh, um, uh, how quantum mechanics and crowd might lead and with many wormholes and all these ideas that are now being discussed. And uh, it could be that there will be a, uh, a burst of activity that will lead to a better understanding of, um, uh, of quantum theory and the fundamentals, uh, which will um, uh, uh, give us better insights into quantum effects and also into these, the information paradox and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, um, maybe Milgram, um, uh, the, the, the idea of Stephen Wolfram's ideas would have some consequence there, but um, uh, his idea seems to be sort of rather classical in a way and so I wouldn't bet too much on it, but I haven't studied it carefully. But I think it's important that um, uh, pe people are now, to a greater extent, um, thinking about the uh, uncertain fundamentals of quantum theory and uh, possibilities that will uh, give uh, a more unified uh, understanding of gravity and the micro world. And good luck to them. It, it's something which um, many theorists shy away from, but it's good that some people, um, Roger Penrose among the leaders, of course, um, are pursuing these ideas. Okay, one, one last push into slightly uncertain regimes. What do you think about the simulation hypothesis? Ah, okay. Um, um, well, again, it's, uh, it's not logically impossible, um, but uh, um, I think it's, I should, I should mention for colleagues who aren't familiar, this is the idea that uh, um, we are all um, in a simulation um, um, created um, within some mega computer produced by some vastly super intelligent species. And uh, this is, um, uh, I think it can't be excluded, um, but I, I, I don't think it's realistic. But uh, um, just w w one uh, bit of advice I'll give you. Um, uh, if we are in a simulation, then of course the risk is that those running the simulation will get bored with watching us and will turn it off and pull the plug. So we've got to keep doing interesting things to make sure that the uh, super civilization doesn't get bored and just pull the plug. So, and, and we should look for small um, uh, um, uh, errors because there may be some uh, uh, computer bugs which lead to imperfections in the physical laws, etc. 
But that's a long way of saying I don't take it very seriously, but I can't rule it out. Okay, thank you. Um, wonderful. So let's wrap this up here. Um, thank you so much, Martin. Uh, thank you. For your time and uh, for making your knowledge available to us. Wonderful, beautiful talk. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to the panelists for being around and asking really great questions today. Uh, thank you to the audience again. Um, please fill out the survey kindly after the Zoom webinar has ended. Um, and I just want to announce our next talk. So it's going to be on February 12th. And as I mentioned already, it's going to be given by Avi Loeb, um, who's a professor of science at Harvard University. And he will be talking about extraterrestrial life. So his new book, right? And he poses the question, are we the sharpest cookies in the jar? So <laughs> let's find out next week. I hope I see you all soon again. Um, so until then, stay safe, stay healthy. And until the next Golden Webinar in Astrophysics. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much.